And now, please welcome your hosts, Amy and Trey Castles. Hey, everyone. It's Amy Castles. I have Trey. You have Trey? I, okay, I'm sorry. I, you know what? We have Trey here. <laughs> Trey Castles. How are y'all doing? We also have a very special guest, Garen Jones. Say hello. Hi, friends. Garen Jones is a motivational speaker in over 60 countries. He does personal coaching, incredible retreats. He's a best-selling author of Change Your Mindset, Change Your Life. But most importantly, he has the most beautiful life story that will absolutely move you to the core. We talk so much about health and wellness on this podcast, but Honestly, the nutrition, the fitness, those are a byproduct after your soul is taken care of. So mind, body, and soul are the key uh, to an overall joyful life. And I am inspired by the amount of, uh, of situations in your life that you learned from and overcame, and now you are vulnerable, vulnerable and you share with the world. Um, Garen was... Grown, he grew up in Houston, Texas. Uh, had attempted murder on him from twice as a young child. Uh, lost your father. Um, abandoned. I homeless. Had it all. Lost it all. Had it all again. And here we are. So, can you here tell us are. a little bit about your story? Um, you know, it, it's so. <laughs> when somebody says, "Can you tell? Can you tell us a little bit about your story?" my whole life flashes before before my eyes and i'm like mm -hmm. a little bit um i just i had a really difficult life and you know when i'm sharing my story i want everybody out there to not just get lost in the story and be like oh yeah good for him i want you to think and imagine anywhere in your life where you feel stuck or maybe someone else, maybe your life is flowing, but someone else in your life feels stuck and you have no answers for them. My story, when listening from that lens, could provide a lot of awareness and insights that will have you leave off this call a completely different human or knowing the exact steps to take to su support somebody that you love you know, throughout your friends and family, um, the community of your friends and family. So a little bit about my story. I, I, I didn't come from money, moved around maybe 10 times, whether it was South Park, Third Ward, Hunter's Glen, Briargate, Ridgegate, um, in Missouri City, Sharpstown. We just kept moving like every two and a half years uh, from when I was a little kid up until uh, I was graduating, so it was natural for me to shift almost every two and a half years. And um, I stopped being a victim probably when I was 32 years old. Some people might go to their grave, grave being a victim, and there are some people that probably had somebody in their life, great parents, that could guide them, but my mom was great the best way she knew how to be great she was just always working and my father was murdered when i was 12 so it was just like me and the streets and my friends and getting in trouble and that was my form of whatever was grooming me to be a, become a young man and so having that and the background that i had i didn't really have much guidance on how to make money what to do with it uh, how you know so many different things how to treat people how to if you become a father what do you do with that uh, how to treat women I never had there was no example in my life to give me um, something worthwhile following when I was younger so I just took what I got and then as an adult I call adults deteriorated children as an adult, I just used those same tools until I was 32 years old. Um, tried to take my life twice. Didn't, just was so stressed out living in my car for two and a half years. There's that two and a half years again. Was in prison for two and a half years. Interesting how when I was a little kid, every two and a half years was a change. And how I'm gonna close off this bit about my past was once I went to a leadership seminar 
And they said successful people are willing to do the things that unsuccessful people won't do. And then I started doing the things that I saw other successful people doing, like reading books, like building people up, like getting healthy. And, and I love that y'all's podcast is cir circumvented around healthy, healthy, active lifestyle, because that was the thing that woke me up to the, the life that I'm living now, because it worked on my my heart, my soul, my spirit, my body, everything that that I completely closed out. Well, to make a long story even shorter, my life is a direct representation of all of the changes that I made when I met a homeless guy um, in the gas station and I asked him for money and he said, you have more money than me. And I said, change your mind. And he said, he said to me, change your mindset, change your life and walked away. <laughs> I now know that that was my angel. And during your childhood, you had hardships every two and a half years. After your childhood, you go out and you're on your own, but you continue to attract the same hardships in your life over and over and over. You said before I, on something that I listened to that you will continually have lessons that God brings you until you actually learn from them and grow. Hmm. So if you do not recognize those lessons and grow from them, you're going to have another one just like it come back in. Yeah. When was your shift in that? Um, I think that, you know, when I was a little kid, I, I always loved puzzles. I love patterns. I love putting puzzle pieces together. Mm -hmm. And, and, um, I think when I started noticing when I started doing, um, triathlons and, and half Ironmans and swimming three miles in the ocean, which are things that I would have never done when I was younger. You know, I ran the 400 hurdles and the 800 in high school, but I never did like running 64 miles over a mountain. I never did any of those things. When I started doing uh, endurance sports and noticing who I was becoming while training for that, while completing those races, I noticed that the things that would surprise me with big challenges in my life started happening a lot less or started lessening the blow of my life. So I was like, man, every single time I train for a big race or I do something where I intentionally seek, seek growth and discomfort, the things that used to blindside me don't, they happen a lot less. They don't happen like they did when I was younger. So I'm gonna keep doing that. So I recognize the pattern while seeking discomfort, I was channeling the parts of me that happens maybe a breakup happens and then i have to figure out a way to adjust my life and overcome that and then in the overcoming comes growth it's when i sought when i was pursuing actively when i was actively pursuing growth i started noticing those random things happening a lot less and then one day I just, one year, I wanted to see what would happen if I didn't pursue anything, if I didn't pursue uncomfort and growth. And they came back again, the random things. And I was like, mm. wait a second, there's something here. So I'm just gonna stick, see, because you can't see the non, you can't see what's in the non-physical world, but you can see the effect of it in the physical world. So it seems like every time I was pursuing growth, difficult time, difficult things and immersing myself into it. Whatever was happening in the non-physical world was producing a different reality in the physical world. So I just kept doing it. And since then I've never stopped since 2012. That's awesome. Trey's been <clears throat> working a lot through that with uh, cold plunges. <laughs> yeah, we have, yeah, we have one downstairs. It's the same. I mean, I wouldn't say the same concept, but it's the concept of doing something that's hard that you don't want to do, but doing it anyway, you overcome this fear, this anxiety, this, this depression, this, this, this anchor that doesn't allow you to do it. And when you accomplish it, the joy you get from that just pushes you to the next one. And at least for me anyway, it's like, I, I started doing that cold plunge and it, it sucked for the first week. 
And then it just started to get easier and easier because I knew what I was getting into and I knew the benefits of it after I got out of it. And then I actually started to seek the benefits of it and I no longer realized the pain because all I remember now coming out of it was the benefit. And so it was, it, it was cool. I believe there is so much connection with gaining strength in our bodies for muscular endurance, muscular strength, that with every bicep curl, with every bench press, every squat, if you visualize that at the same time that your body is getting stronger, your mind is getting stronger and your heart are getting stronger, you are just creating... I. I I go a little deep and I visualize my heart pounding, um, just this super energetic organ, just getting stronger and pounding out blood and this vibration almost coming over me that it just makes my day more powerful, uh, makes every day more powerful. I I love that so much. And, you know, I, I, I personally coach some really, really high level athletes on how to not just be talented in their sport, but to be skilled in what your sport is, you being talented, what is actually happening on a deeper level. Mm -hmm. So I teach them how to overstand and understand what happens when they're doing something over and over and over again and how to set powerful intentions and it not just be something that your dad or mom taught you when you were a little kid, but when I'm working with athletes, it's al- aligning the full embodiment of, of the spiritual and the and the physical self, which is pretty much what you're saying. And I just I love it. I this is something that is a non-negotiable for my life, especially if you're wanting to do big things in a world and you come across big personalities and you want to lead big organizations. Well, to lead other leaders, it's easier to lead followers, but to lead other mm-hmm. leaders that shape and cultivate other leaders, that takes a different type of mentality. And, you know, me always being ahead of the curve allows me to be grounded in my body and not lose myself because of all of that work that you're that, you, that you're talking about, the discomfort work. Mm-hmm. Okay, I want to talk about inner child for a moment. So my just so favorite. everybody... Yes. So your your child, your inner child that you have uh, created was uh, just so everybody knows, we met Garen Jones and his wife, um, Blair and their baby soul in the airport. Uh, I saw his little girl and I thought, oh, my gosh, she is the most adorable little girl I have ever seen. Her hair is absolutely gorgeous. Such a unique, beautiful color. She is truly a beautiful soul. Well, can I tell you what what stood out for me when I first what what actually mesmerized me about you and your family is in the airport. It's just gloomy and nobody's happy. Everybody's just kind of head down, getting to where they need to go. And y'all's family just had this glow about you. There was this energy and it was infectious. It was like, I want to look at that. I want to see what these guys are doing. And what I saw was joy. I saw you playing with your daughter, your daughter interacting with you, you interacting with your wife and y'all didn't care who was around. (laughs) <laughs> y'all were being you, y'all were being so joyful and smiles. And it was just, it was mesmerizing. And I was like, man, that's a cool couple. And then, you know, my son met you and then, I don't know, it ended up meeting our energies met at the baggage claim when we got back from LA. Well, and actually, that's started. actually, I noticed his necklace and oh, I was sorry, like, you did I was first. like, oh, at first, I, you know, I saw you and I was like, this, fa- this family's very special. Like there's something very special. And then I saw your necklace and I was like, oh yeah. He's conscious. He, he gets it. <laughs> and, and then I saw your son. I saw your son first because he was, he like did something for us, like let us cut in line or something like that. And I remember us coming and then I remember mm-hmm. us coming back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, it was cool. It was, it was an energy for sure. Well, so back to inner child. So your inner child, you talk a lot about that and This is where someone finds their true joy. Like I said before, we talk a lot about health and wellness, nutrition and fitness and exercise and things like that, but it's actually a very small part of our podcast, those topics, because our joy is truly what matters the most. And finding your joy comes through accessing your inner child. So can you talk about 
what it is an inner child for somebody who has no idea what that means. Yeah, so uh, the, the, the simplest way I can put it is that everybody that is watching this, that is listening to this, that's going to be shared this, that kind of mm -hmm. listens and that fully listens, has been a child once. Mm -hmm. And at some point in your childhood was a natural state of joy. Whether you remember it or not, there's at some point. And most, as I've traveled around the world to now 77 different countries, um, I see so, I see and feel so much suffering and inner turmoil, suffering. And on the surface is racism, is uh, is 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 hatred is fighting physical abuse mental abuse spiritual abuse white and black man and woman trans no trans vax no vax and it's just everybody mm -hmm. pinning on each other but underneath yeah. I don't even see any of those things what I see is a suffering child who yeah. doesn't feel love enough to love themselves because only hurt people hurt people and if you're wounded your wound comes out on other people that comes from an act of suffering most of the time from the child. And so the work that I do in the world is when I meet adults, I only see the kid inside of the adult. Either they're hurting or they're not. And you can always tell when they're not hurting. And there's no judgment on my part. I'm just holding space possibly for, you know, for an arena that, most children maybe never had a conscious person hold space for. So the inner child is the kid inside of you. As I feel that adults are deteriorated children and they have all the gifts, all of the energy, all of the power, all of the bigness, all of the bravery, the risk taking, all of these things. And most people in the world are working jobs that they know deep down inside they don't want to do they're in relationships mm -hmm. that they, they, they don't want to be in and all of this is a result of what started from the little kid abandoning your first love which is whatever made you joyous whatever made you happy whatever brought you the most energy whatever made you the most free so what i do is teach people in a safe way how to take a journey through the inner walls of their scary, release that energy and tap back into the little kid that you've mm -hmm. always been, which I feel is the little voice inside of you saying, do this, try this, say mm -hmm. this. And um, so, yeah, that's, that's my work in the world. And yeah, the inner child is the little kid inside of you. And I teach people how to tap back into that energy and remember just how resilient and, and majestic and magnificent you are. And it's interesting how a topic like this could seem like it's only for the most expressive, outgoing people, and it actually isn't. I've worked with top CEOs and founders of companies, and they're just like, man, I got all of these millions, and yet... I don't know how to have fun. I don't know how to, I don't have energy for my children. I don't have this. And when I teach them how to align themselves mm -hmm. fully, fully, then the energy is natural. The resilience is natural. The passion is natural. The love is natural. The gifts, the creativity is natural. Just look at a kid. Now you tap back into that little kid well, then you're just an adult harnessing the your 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 deepest, most influential power that's latent inside of your soul. That is the simplest way I know for a very <laughs> complex topic. It is a very hey man, we're all still Toys R Us kids, okay? That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> I think that having our own children has helped us to access our inner child uh, Absolutely. so much. Sometimes I feel like Trey is one. Of the, I had I had to tell him last night we had no power <laughs> until about 10 o'clock and then the power comes on about 10, 15 and him and Evan, our teenage son, which it's like 
Trey back to life again. He's back to life with through our team. I'm, I'm a junior high kid. They right are now. in there at 10:30 wrestling, and I'm like, boys, <laughs> boys, I told go you to bed. I say, like, hey, you just got me in trouble. I'm yeah. gonna have to go in there and take this for both of us. You, you, are, and, and then <laughs> Trey and I have this year, just this year. I mean, we we've been married 20 years. We've gone through a lot of crap, a lot of crap, and but we've grown together. We've grown to, together emotionally, spiritually, physically, like all the areas. We've just grown, and every single month, it's like boom, next level, boom, next level. And just this last year, him and I both have been helping each other through moments of where we see that inner child crying or throwing a fit or we don't react to each other in a way that is um condescending or rude it's like we take a moment to just say why did she do that that yeah. wasn't her you know what what what, what is she upset about it's not at me so why what, what can i do to help why she's feeling that way and i don't know it's 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 been a peaceful journey this year to navigate in that way. There's so much peace in it. it your stories that I listen to, your inner child, uh, who you were as a little kid, there was so much anointing over your life. Mm. It is truly remarkable the things that you went to th that you went through. Being told you were going to Disneyland and being put in a dryer, someone yeah. pushing you in a bayou to try to kill you. I, I think it, to me, the most powerful thing, I was listening last night to the to the upgrade part, and uh, I think it was chapter six and chapter seven of love, and it was truly profound, the forgiveness that you were able to give yeah. in in your journey, and, and how you went back to all of the hurt and the pain that was done to you in your life, and then you just graciously just forgave, and the freedom that you, you're you saying, and, and I hear in your voice that you get from that is just infectious. That moves us right into forgiveness. Yeah. You know, it is, uh, I say all the time, forgiveness is freedom. Mm -hmm. And what even got me on this journey is one day I, while I was transforming my life and, and just building a, a stronger relationship with God. And one day I just, I was on Facebook and there was a girl that I went to school with named Tess Hall and we were seven years old. And every time I go on Facebook, mind you, this is like 35 years later, <laughs> and every time I go on Facebook, I like, always remember when I pulled the, her hoodie over her head and hit her in the head with a backpack when I was seven years old. I never, I was just like, that's the only memory I have. And we had classes and everything after that. So I decided to message her and I was like, um, hey, Tess, I know you don't remember this, but um, I, you know, kids do the stupidest thing. I just want to apologize to you for pulling a drawstring over your head and hitting you over the head with a backpack. Now, mind you, we were talking back and forth, like boom, 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 boom. How have you been? All this other stuff. And then I shared this. She read it and didn't respond. And I was like, wait, mm. we were going back and forth. Then I went on Facebook public and wrote a public apology. Kids do the stupidest things. One minute later, she said, can you please remove that? I'm in tears right now. Oh, and I was like, wait, 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 what? People hold on to something. And my spiritual advisors say, no, it's not that they hold on. It's like they're left with the last way that you made them feel. Mm -hmm. And so a re, if you tap into that wound, it opens, it reopens that, that trigger again. And so you re-triggered something that was never closed. And I remember being baffled the fact that Oh my goodness. Then she wrote down one, why did you do that? Two, what about me made you do that? Three, same thing has happened to my children and I don't know what to tell them. And I was like, oh mm. my God, <laughs> I have so many people to apologize to and so many people to forgive. Mm. And that's what started me on the deep work. And I was like, man, I'm just gonna go back. And I wrote a list from kindergarten all the way up to present moment to people that have hurt wow. me, to people that I have hurt in mm -hmm. thought, physically, all these things with the intention 
of apologizing to them for my part without expecting them to, to respond. Whatever their response is, is their work. But I was transforming my life. And so I forgave myself first for holding on to resentment. And then I, I apologized to my part. Simultaneously, when I was doing that, because I, you know, I got started in my health and well health and wellness career, I was starting to get new clients. I would like forgive three people, and then three new clients would come in. I'm like, huh? And I love puzzles, so I'm like putting these patterns together. I forgive five people, and then like five new people would be interested in my business. <laughs> and I'm not saying that this will happen to everyone. But I am saying that there is a universal order. That is law. This mm -hmm. is the, the oldest living law in the world is how nature actually works. You drop yeah. a seed into the ground. You put give it proper water and sunlight. I don't care who the government is, you red or black or whatever your titles are. You drop a seed into the ground every time, providing mm -hmm. it's fertile soil, proper water and sunlight. You tend the weeds, something will grow. So... There is a universal order to how life actually works. So I mm -hmm. started noticing these patterns of releasing hate from e no matter how old it was inside of me and watching it be restored, kind of like nature always restores itself. Wow. That's that's the simplicity. Mm -hmm in the complexity makes it so easy to understand when you put it that way. Very much so. You had to get to this point of doing the emotional work because yeah. so many people, including myself, we go through our, our childhood, we go through our adolescence, we make a lot of mistakes. Then usually somewhere along the way, you know, if you're a person that's awake, uh, you're going to, receive something um you you got a book called the power of positive thinking yeah and you read that but then you kind of put it down and then life went on continued on the same pattern but somewhere you picked it up again how was that a shift for you that was the that was the beginning right because you were homeless at that point yeah I, you know it it was the beginning of what i was aware of See, mm -hmm. every other time I read that book, all these amazing things would happen. I mm -hmm. just didn't know it was what I was reading that was dropping into my subconscious mind and overflowing into the physical reality of my life. I had no idea. So I'm just like reading the book and booking all these modeling jobs and, and working with Beyonce and, and, and all these different people in the industry and L'Oreal and Old Navy and Tommy Hilfiger doing all this other stuff. I didn't know that, you know, the, and the, the, the power of positive thinking is a book that's based off of biblical principles. I had no idea. You're I right. just didn't know. I never read books because I had a speech impediment coming out through coming out of high school. I never read books anyways. It was just a book that was given to me. I pulled it off the shelf and I started reading like this over enunciating my voice so that it would stretch. And by the time I was done, I was talking like this. So I was just reading to train because that was the book that I had to, to train my enunci enunciation, not realizing. I wasn't even aware that I'm learning wow. all of these bibl biblical principles, love yourself, love your neighbor, mm -hmm. Forgiveness, mm -hmm. letting go, yep. think positively, and all this other stuff. Because one, I didn't understand the Bible, but th this was Norman Vincent Peale, who was a pastor. That is his perspective of certain things that came out of Psalms, you know. And mm. so I'm reading this book, and my life is massively shifting. But I was unaware that it was what I was reading and the spirit that was coming through me. So when mm -hmm. I put the book down and made it about me, the human, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm good. I, you know, I'm, I'm the shit. I'm this. I'm that. <laughs> Ego sets in. I lose it all. So it wasn't until I picked up the book again after somebody on the leadership stage said leaders are readers. When you find a real good mm -hmm. book, 
You will find results in your life. Don't ever put that book down. Make that something that's just a running. Don't read a book for memory. Read it for mastery. And you'll know when you're in mastery of it because your life will look like the information that's stored into the pages. I never put that book down. So it's over 300 reads between the paperback and audiobook. And I still, I read a lot of other stuff, but this is the one that's a constant for me. Mm -hmm. Dang. There were (laughs) two times that you were in jail. Once as an adolescence. Yeah. And that's when a a man might have been your guardian angel. Yeah. Another another guardian angel. What is that? The like the fourth or fifth um, <laughs> tells you about the Lord's prayer, and then another one. You were in jail in France, which oh my gosh, that had to have been so scary. <laughs> Tell me about that uh, that first time because you were young. So I'm imagining, I'm visualizing you probably not having read The Power of Positive Thinking no, before the age of fourteen. Old. Yeah. Yeah. No, okay. I was fourteen years old. I didn't read books, and I remember. I had I had got busted for, and I was already on probation for um, for breaking into into cars, which I wasn't really breaking into cars. This was my version. This is my young brain. I thought all all white people were rich um, <laughs> and all black people were poor. So I'd go to the white neighborhood, which it was just people in a different class. And all I saw was white people. So as a 14 year old, this is what I say. I go to the white neighborhood and then open up their car doors because they never lock the car doors. Then I open up and take whatever's valuable. So that's considered breaking in. So um, I've learned my lesson since then. It's just a different class. Like I live in a different class of neighborhood now. Um, but I go to those neighborhoods and I broke into 60, I, I opened 62 car doors that were open and took everything that was valuable. And I was already on probation. So they put me in juvenile but they were trying me as an adult because i had more than one felony because each car that i broke Mm. into was a felony so i had 62 felonies on my record and the the deal was by the time i was 15 they would take me out of juvenile put me in prison for teenagers which is tyc and then after Mm -hmm. one year they would try me as an adult and i would go to Mm actual prison with these grown men and and at that time i didn't start puberty till i was 18 years old so i was a little kid for a very long time i graduated high school i was five seven and a half i'm six foot one now and so i um yeah yeah, no it's crazy so i'm in juvenile not thinking i'm gonna get out and I see this guy and something inside said, Garen, ask him how you can get out. I wasn't supposed to get